Hi guys, this is Shannon from Reptile Way and we've also got Gimli behind me to help me out with this video. But um, today we're actually going to be telling you a little bit of a secret we've been keeping. Um, Reptile Way, as you know, we're located in Darwin um, in the top end of Australia but we're actually going to be relocating down south to Victoria. So we're going to be doing a few videos on this big move and we're going to be talking about how you can uh, keep your reptiles in temporary setups, uh, preparing travel tubs, preparing easy hides, and also the road trip. Um, so it's gonna be quite an exciting set of videos, but also sad as well, you know, leaving this amazing place. And it's, it's been a pretty awesome journey um, getting to live in the Northern Territory. Um, so we're also gonna show some happy moments and a little bit about the time I've spent up here and then my business, Reptile Way. But um, the first video we're actually gonna do is we're gonna show you how to set up your animals in temporary setups and then preparing their travel tubs um, if you need to transport your animals and um, yeah just all that information that isn't really out there and as well going through the permits um, to be able to legally transport your animals across Australia but let's dive into this video. We're going to start off by preparing their reptiles travel tubs so these are all the travel tubs I'm going to be using for all of my reptiles, different sizes depending on the species of reptile. They've also got water dishes that will be siliconed in, but these are the exact tubs that I'm using for my trip. So if you wanted to replicate this, um, you know what tubs I've been using. And it's really important if you're going to be transporting these guys to do a bit of a test before you really set up these travel tubs. Make sure they fit in the space you want them to fit in. So I want them to all fit in the boot section of my car so I can also take some other belongings with me in the car. But now we're going to start off by setting up the green tree pythons travel tub. And this is an arboreal animal so I need perches in there. I need to make sure I can make this a humid environment. But we're going to start off by putting these perches in and I'm using this wood burner so I can burn some holes into this tub and I can thread the perches through. And these are just broken bits of plastic coat hangers, um, which is really, really useful, sanitized, and then you can put them in. Now I'm putting three rows of air holes in and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to black these travel tubs out. Really important to keep the animals nice and calm. And the reason why I'm painting it and I didn't buy blacked out tubs, the clear tubs are cheaper and I had excess paint from all my other builds that I'm not taking with me to Victoria. I'm not taking all my building supplies. So I thought I'll use as much of my building supplies as I can. So I'm blacking out the tubs myself, um, which was a bit time consuming, but a lot cheaper. But here are all the travel tubs. You can see them all blacked out. And when the animals are going to be put in the boot, it means they're not going to see one another. It's not going to stress them out. But there isn't paint where the air holes are, so they're going to get a little bit of light so they can really have the day and night cycles as well. But now on to creating their hides. Now I'm using their travel tubs to I guess assess the size of the hides and I'm using a hot wire cutter that you can get off Amazon pretty sure I bought this off Amazon and yeah I'm using the travel tubs to sort of um, guide me on the size because this is the smallest space these hides are going to go into and um, so that's why I've got the travel tub there but this I'm just using, again, excess materials I had. This is packing foam, um, foam that you find in furniture boxes, TV boxes, um, all those sorts of things. So that's what I'm using to build some of these hides out of. And I want to increase that surface area. So I want there to be not only a lot of surface area on the bottom, but having a hide that has quite a bit of surface area on top of it um, so it makes that space bigger 
almost. And as well, I want it to be high enough that the animal can get underneath and hide in it. But also, if it wants to cool down, escape that heat pad a little bit, it can sit on top of that hide. Um, so it really am creating, you know, some temperature variance in this tub as best as I can for this trip. But what I'm also doing is I'm sort of stacking bits of foam on top of one another to create stilts that this main part of the hide can sit on, I guess. And yeah, the stilts themselves aren't going to take up a lot of surface area room. But once the grout and concrete is on there, it's going to be sturdy enough, strong enough that they're not going to break as well. But we're continuing making the hides the same process. I do like to use a hot wire cutter because it's a bit quicker, less messy, especially with foam, packing foam. Um, you can use a knife, but you're going to get little bits everywhere. The vacuuming job is a bit bigger. Now, here we've got this multi-use insulation foam boards that you used to be able to get from Bunnings. You can no longer get this um, from most Bunnings across Australia, which is a bit of an unfortunate thing. But if you do go into the insulation section, so it's in Bunnings, I guess, in the wood section towards the back, you generally have to walk upstairs and there's rolls of insulation. You can get these big insulation sheets that have, I guess, um, some silver foil stuck to each side of it. You just rip that silver foil off and you've got some big sheets of foam. Um, so that's also a good thing you can use. But anyway, here's all the hides um, that I've made, created for this move. And we're going to get on to the next stages, which is the grouting. So these are the products that I'm using because that's what I had available to me. Um, and again, I'm trying to use all these building materials I can before I go because I'm not bringing them along with me. Now, what I like to do is I like to flip the pieces on to, um, to focus on their underside first. So I sort of coat the stilts, the underneath, and this is going to provide strength for when you flip it over and then you put grout on top. So this is just how I prefer to do it. I prefer to do the underside first. You want to apply three to four layers of grout. Start off with a thick pancake consistency. And after that first layer, because it's thick, um, and the grout's a thick consistency, you may see some cracks, no need to worry. Your layers of grout are gonna get thinner and thinner as you progress. The thinner the layers will cover all those cracks, and by the time you've done the thir third or fourth layer, you won't have any cracks, or you shouldn't really have any cracks. Now in my final layers, I'm adding some dyes to my grout, and again, it's because I what I had available from Gimli, the Bearded Dragon enclosure build. And I'm just dyeing it some beautiful, earthy Australian colours, some reds, some browns, um, just to make it a little bit more aesthetically pleasing. As well, you can carve into it. You want to do it when it's damp to the touch, so it's not completely dry, but it's not wet. And that's the best time to carve. If you carve when it's dry, it's going to be too hard. If you carve when it's too wet... Um, a lot of the grout's going to come off. Now we're going to do the spray painting phase. So for this, you're going to get a cheap spray, wa spray water bottle and you're going to put some paint in. I'm using some browns and I'm starting off with a somewhat lighter brown and I'm just going to spray it over the piece. It just gives it, I guess, like an airbrush feel. It's going to add a bit more colour and again, just make it look a bit more aesthetically pleasing and less plain and just one single block of color and it's going to add some depth to it as well. Now we're going to go in with a darker brown so I've just added some black to that brown paint and water and I'm using acrylic paints. This is safe for reptiles. It's water-based so it doesn't have any nasties. Now you want to let your piece completely dry before you do this, the dry brushing. And I'm just using white paint. And again, it's not some of my prettiest builds or prettiest hides. I was on a time crunch and I had to create hides for all of my reptiles. So it was a bit hard um, to make it all look really nice and natural. So doing the best I can with the time that I have um, available to me. But again, I still like things to look sort of pretty and I don't want to spend a whole bunch of money 
on hides from the shop that aren't the right sizes that I want or don't provide the right amount of enrichment. Um, now with this, I do like to use quite a lot of white and make it sort of pop a bit more because when you do the waterproofing, it does dull the color down a little bit. So keep that in mind. It may look like, wow, it's standing out, but when the waterproofing happens, it sort of dulls it a little bit. But now we're going on to the waterproofing stage now. And again, same with the grouting. I'm just flipping my pieces over. I'm going to waterproof the underside first. And you want to do about anywhere between three, four layers. You can do more as well if you want it to last a little bit longer. And I flipped it up the right side and waterproofed on that side. But now we're going straight into setting up these temporary tub setups. Um, so you will see the completed hides again when we put them in these tub setups. So I'm just using those coil bricks from Bunnings. I'm sort of breaking it all up. I'm putting some water in there. And these are quite hard to break up when they're dry. So you can leave them in there with water, put a lid on it. The humidity is going to build up and it's going to make it easier to break this apart. See how easy that is to break apart now, um, now that it's got that moisture in there. So this is a good product to mix with the Critters Comfort Cocoa Fiber. Um, so I'm using, going to use two bags of that, mix it all together. And this is going to be the substrate for pretty much all my animals besides the bearded dragon. So this is just going to allow some nice humidity when, when these animals are moving, um, as well as their temporary setups. And you want to give it a nice good mix. You want to make sure it's all mixed together. They're going to get, you know, an even amount of each of those products. And now we're setting up the Blue Tongue Lizard's temporary setups. And when you're moving, yes, it's not going to be as good as an actual enclosure because I had to sell all my enclosures. But for the sake of them being in it a week or so, or even a few weeks, this is still going to provide the enrichment and everything they need. And this is dry season too. So lots of my animals are in a bit of a brumation phase, which is sort of a reptile version of hibernation. My blueies are buried. They're hunkered down. They're really not doing much. They're eating once a week, if that, um, being super lazy. So there's not really much going on with them. So having them in a bit of a smaller setup is not really going to be too bad for them because they're not really moving at all anyway. But we've set up one of the tubs. Now we're moving on to the next one. And the sphagnum moss is really good to put in underneath that hide. It's just going to allow them to be able to bury themselves. These are burrowing animals. They love to dig and bury themselves. Also, they do like that humidity as well. Sphagnum moss is great for providing humidity. And if they are shedding, you can spray that sphagnum moss down in that hide to provide a bit of a humid hide. This is the UVB light I'm using temporarily. So we're using the security light from Bunnings with a UVB light. Yes, it's not the best lighting, but it'll do for temporarily them just being in there for a few weeks. And they are getting added vitamins, added vitamin D3, calcium, a bit more extra vitamins with this whole move going on. So be aware of that. Um, that's really important to consider when you are moving your animals, if they're not going to get all the natural light they were once getting. Because um, these guys were in outside enclosures. They had lighting, but then also they had the sunlight coming in. So I'm just factoring that in and I'm compensating for there being less UVB and I'm replacing that with vitamins. But this is the last bluey tub setup. And now it's time to put them in. So here's Bangers, an absolute cutie. She was one of my first reptiles that I got. And she's first into the tub, loving it, exploring it. Um, yeah, and it, they are. They're not terrible setups. Um, obviously, my animals are in big outdoor enclosures. So it is a little bit of a change for them. Um, but again, this is sometimes what you have to do when you're transporting animals or moving house. There's onyx in there as well. And we've got our breeding couple. We've got Lizzie on the left and Hannibal on the right. 
Hannibal was not happy to be separated from his girlfriend right around breeding time, but I couldn't risk um, Lizzie being pregnant, so they're separated. But this was them feeding a day or so after putting them in those tubs, and that's a good sign that they're comfortable, they're relaxed, they're not stressed if they're eating well. And yeah, and you can see Onyx is a little greedy guts absolutely scoffs his food every time but anyway now we're moving on to the green tree pythons temporary setup so you can see same process with its transportable tub I used that wood burner to burn the holes in threaded those perches through I've secured them from the outside with gorilla tape just so they're not going to shift around too much I'm using a a lot of water dishes instead of one big water dish in case it poos in its water dish dirties it there's always going to be a clean water source even though the water does get changed quite regularly and we're putting in lots of fake plants for coverage squiggle loves hiding in the vegetation and it really helps them being hidden in almost like a canopy let's mimic their natural environment but this enclosure Squiggle was in, I am unfortunately going to be selling it. So sad. Squiggle absolutely loved it. Beautiful waterfall enclosure. Little water holes in amongst the wall. But yeah, we'll just have to make some more cool stuff, I guess. Now, before this move, uh, Squiggle was yellow. Squiggle is now green. Just before we moved, Squiggle changed colours. So I'm glad the colour changing process happened before we leave, before we left Darwin. So that was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, there's Squiggle's temporary setup. And you can see there's a bit of um, some mesh there so I can put a heat source. But again, the room that they're in is a beautiful 27 to 32 degrees. So it's because Darwin, tropics, perfect reptile temperature that you don't really need a lot of heating or lighting up there. But I'm definitely going to experience a little bit of difference when I come to Victoria. Now we're setting up Dynamo's temporary setup. So we're putting Dynamo's hide in. Dynamo is a renowned sook, so we need plenty of vegetation for that dude to hide in. And we're going to take Dynamo out of its beautiful enclosure that, again, I will be selling because glass enclosures don't hold heat that well down south where it's cold. And it's not going to hold the humidity nicely with all that mesh on top. So it's just not really going to work. So I'll be selling those enclosures, unfortunately. But Dynamo, what a stunning snake. Not looking as stunning as what it normally looks because I think Dynamo is literally about to shed. Um, but Dynamo is a granite children's python. And Dynamo is loving exploring its new home. And I uh, ended up putting a bit of a loggy branch thing in there, which Dynamo fell in love with and was continually hugging. And here's the jerk slinky. This guy tries to bite me all the time. Now, children's pythons generally are really friendly, good pets, and they grow out of being bitey. The babies can be a bit bitey, and they generally grow out of it, especially with handling. This one is a flat-out jerk. So, <laughs> Slinky just wants to eat and bite everyone. Whenever I change Slinky's water... It's there ready to bite me. I have to have a hook or even use a plastic tub lid as a guard. Um, so this is by far the most aggressive reptile I have ever owned. Um, but there it is in its temporary setup. Again, coming out to try bite me. Um, loves its food. This girl has never missed a feed. And here we've got gorgeous Pearl. So change of pace. She's a beautiful marble children's python. Super friendly. Never had any issues with her. Total opposite personality to Slinky. And she's going into her new home. And you can see I've included uh, rocks, branches, their hide to create all different textures, surfaces to assist with shedding, enrichment. Even though they are in tub temporary setups, I don't like my animals, you know, to be neglected or not have all the things that they need. So their temporary setups do have everything these guys need to thrive. 
And this little guy's name is Noodle. Noodle is also a marble children's python, a male. And he's only a year old, so a couple years younger than Pearl, the other one. But again, loving its new temporary home. And now I'm showing you how I'm going to create these lids. How do I put that mesh in to create windows to put the lights on? So I'm using that wood burner again and we're just going to pretty much cut out this hole. And then I had some leftover sort of fly screen mesh stuff um, that you can put heat lamps on and it's not going to do anything. It holds up to the heat quite nicely. And I'm just Gorilla Taping this mesh to the container. I'm using Gorilla Tape because, again, I had endless amounts of it and I'm trying to use up all these materials. And it seems to hold the mesh in place really, really well and even holds up to the heat quite nicely. Obviously, you don't want to pop the heat lamp on that tape. You want to make sure it's nice and centre and it's not going to necessarily melt the tape. Um, but yeah, it seems to stick down quite nicely, even with a heat lamp in the middle of it, letting off that heat. And these are the types of lights and bulbs I'm using for my temporary tub setups. So I'm just using 50 watt bulb with these, um, particular light fixtures and this is what all my animals look like in their temporary tub setups in a room that is, again, perfect temperature for reptiles. I'm just having these heat bulbs just to provide a slight hot spot um, for them. But yeah, they seem to be quite nice. My blueies don't really need a hot spot. Again, it's perfect temperature, this room, for them. So I got lucky with that. But now here's a look at some of the enclosures that I had to sell, which is quite sad. Especially this one. I was so attached to this one. This reptile tank was second hand. I bought it for $50 and I did all the rock work. I even made a build video on it. It was an awesome build to do and Pearl loved it. There was a cave on each side, the hot and cool side. She loved exploring. Got all tired from exploring as you're about to see with this big yawn. <laughs> But yeah, she loved this enclosure. I think she's a bit sad to see it go too. And then also I had to sell um, this ruins build that I did that Diglett absolutely loved. Um, so yeah, it was a bit bittersweet selling all these things, but I had so many happy customers that were grateful. This was Onyx's setup as well with all the rock work. Um, so yeah, a lot of things selling, but on to new things. We're going to be doing lots of builds down south. Here's Squiggle in its gorgeous waterfall sort of setup that I did um, with a raised water hole. So again, Squiggle loved that enclosure. Um, yeah, so it was hard to let go of these enclosures, but again, you can always build new things and the animals can enjoy it. Um, so yeah, it's not all bad. But again, the reason why I am selling this and if you're moving to a cold place, you do have to remember glass tanks don't hold heat well. If you're in a warm area, by all means, they're great. But because I don't want to use so much heating in my reptile room, I want to use minimal heating. I want their enclosures to hold and keep the heat. So that's why I'm getting custom made wooden enclosures um, in Victoria. And that's just a personal preference. If you want to heat up a whole room for your animals and don't mind high power bills, go for it. Anyway, this was the outdoor bluey enclosure. That was their breeding enclosure, Hannibal and Lizzie's bioactive, beautiful large setup. Now, these are the enclosures I'm taking. So Gimli, the bearded dragon's enclosure is coming with us down south. And um, so that gets put on a truck. And I guess you will find out the fate of that enclosure in the next couple of videos. 
I'm also taking this wardrobe enclosure. And again, these enclosures, like this one weighs over 100 kilos. Gimli's is probably on 100 kilos as well. So this is Diglett's The Black-Headed Pythons enclosure, and it was a war wardrobe conversion. The only thing is if I do decide to keep this enclosure and don't decide to sell it, um, there is a lot of mesh which is not going to hold the heat especially down south. Um, so I could replace it with plexiglass. I could do some alterations, but we'll see where that goes. So all the travel tubs are ready to go, but I want to do some temperature testing. So I'm going to show you how you can temperature test these. And I had never used these heat pads before, but I wanted ones that would last four to five days the entire trip but I didn't need to use a heat pad on my first day because again, I'm still in the warm climate. So um, I didn't use it for the first day drive, but I think I did put the heat pads in on the first day, but at night I put the heat pads into the enclosure. So again, that was just because I didn't, I didn't need them any earlier than that. The car was a nice warm temperature for them. But anyway, here's the directions of how to use it. And I sort of followed that. I wrapped it up, the heat packs in newspaper. And that was just something that was going to work well for me. I did temperature testing over seven days. And it was at a beautiful hot spot temperature for all my reptiles. So it actually panned out nicely. But when you're doing the temperature testing of whatever heat pads you decide to go with, just make sure you mimic the environment that you're going to be putting it in. So I'm using the same amount of substrate. I'm going to be putting in these transportable tubs. I'm going to be wrapping it in the exact same way for each of the tubs. And all you're wanting to do is you're wanting to create a nice warm spot that your animal can go to heat up if it needs to, to help with its, you know, digestion, especially if it's like a bearded dragon. Gimli had two of these in her enclosure as she was eating on the trip. The blue tongue lizards, the snakes, they can go a week without food or so. So it's just to have a nice hot spot for them to feel comfortable and not get too cold. But this is how I recorded the temperatures. I did it over, you know, a seven day period. I recorded the temperatures every hour or so or whenever I really could. And I recorded three temperatures. So on the pad itself, just off the pad and to the far side on the cool side. Um, yeah, and I jotted those temperatures down. So I'll just show you how I recorded it. I flattened out the newspaper so it was quite flat to the heat pad, recorded that temperature on it. So the hot spot just off the heat pad as well. And then the cool side. And then I also recorded the room temperature as well. Um, and yeah, after I did this testing, I knew that it was good for my animals. But anyway, this move, we are going from the top end of Australia, Darwin to Victoria. So we come out of the NT into South Australia, out of South Australia into Victoria. So lots of import export licenses. So I need to export out of the NT, import export into South Australia, and I need an import and a wildlife advance license for Victoria. So quite a bit of paperwork. Now, to be honest, the NT Parks and Wildlife was the best. My permits got done nice and quickly. They were really helpful. They gave me all the correct information. This is exactly what the form looks like. Um, if you were to do it yourself. And I also confirmed to make sure all my animals were allowed to come out. This is the South Australia import one. And it's three pages long, so a little bit longer. And the export what um, the export forms as well, because I'm going in and out of South Australia because I'm driving through it, so I needed to fill out all this paperwork. And I had too many animals to fit on one lot of paperwork, so I had to do two lots for each. And I needed the wildlife advance license for my animals because my green tree python falls into that category but look at the regulations as to what your animals fall into don't just rely on the helpline information because they can get it wrong Morelia viridis falls in schedule three that's why i needed the advanced license 
And yeah, so you just need to make sure you read up all your information. This is what their import form looks like for Victoria. A simple one page, easy one. The only thing I did have trouble with was just put your blue tongue lizards as common blue tongue eastern. They don't recognize lots of the subspecies. But anyway, this is my wildlife record book that I sent over with the forms. So thank you so much guys for watching this video. Please stick with us over the next few weeks for some more content. We've still got um, a video pretty much saying goodbye to Darwin. You know, lots of amazing experiences you can do up here, um, nature wise, animal wise, and then as well as the road trip and setting up all of our animals down south. But until then, we'll see you next time. Bye guys.